Good morning. Welcome to Greenwoods. Welcome to our new sermon series, Created for Significance. So, just sort of stepping back and looking at where we've come from, we spent the summer, uh, a lot of the summer, integrating our faith and our work in our Faith at Work series. I hope we realized that every single one of us has kingdom work to do. Do you all know that? Do you all feel that? We're all employed by our Creator, whether we show up to an office or whether we show up to a field or the kitchen in our home, whether we're changing tires or changing diapers, we are all a part of God's workforce. And every job that we do that God has for us is important. Amen? We then took what we learned about faith and work and looked at the rest of our lives. How to, how do we walk the path of obedience as Christ followers? And the path series really seemed to resonate with a lot of us. I got overwhelming feedback that this series, the path series, really spoke to many of you. Praise God. I always welcome feedback. And today we're starting a series that I'm very excited about, created for significance. And again, this is building on everything we've learned thus far. If you need to catch up, no worries, no stress, right? All sermons are posted online on our website, greenwoodschurch.com. Just click on sermons in the menu bar at the top. They're all there. And the sermons are posted with slides integrated as well, so that should make viewing and listening more meaningful. There's also an MP3 posted now for those that like to listen to podcasts, while you're driving or on your mobile device. Hopefully we make it easy for you all to tune in. So in this series, I pray that we see, and for some of us, we rediscover our value as God's people. There's purpose, there's meaning, there's value and worth in God's eyes as He looks in each and every one of us. I hope we feel that. I hope we know that. We are precious to Him. There is indeed significance. And we will see, I pray, as with every blessing from God, our significance is meant to be shared. Meaning as we shine Jesus, as we shine Christ's light wherever our front lines take us, others should be drawn to that light of Christ. Find purpose and meaning and value and worth and significance. Does that make sense? So in this series, we're going to be spending some time in the Gospel of Luke. We'll start with Luke chapter 14, and then we'll spend some time in Luke chapter 15, and we'll end the series with Luke chapter 16. If, you're, if you prioritize being here as often as you can for this entire series, I can promise you this. You will better understand the heart of Greenwood's Community Church and you yourself will get a better sense of your worth and your significance in God's eyes. I can promise you that. I can pray that you receive that. That we all feel God's intentions for our lives as well. Sounds like pretty good reasons to show up for the next few weeks, right? Doesn't it? I plan on being here. So, so early on in the PATH series, I said this, the amazing thing about our Bibles, the amazing thing about Scripture is that as we read it, these histories, these accounts, the spiritual mirror, you remember when I said this, the spiritual mirror is continually held up to us as we read His Word. As we continue to read Scripture, God continues to hold up that mirror. And it's as if He's continually asking us, what would you have done, my child? What would you have done in this story? Don't be so hasty in your judgment of Adam and Eve, of King David, of, of Peter. Satan is called the great deceiver, the father of lies, the ancient serpent for a reason. He's been trying to deceive you for quite a long time, hum humanity. And he's extremely good at what he does. So we're going to use this idea in this series of the spiritual mirror throughout. And I will be honest, my friends, for me at least, gazing into that mirror when God holds it up can be challenging. <laughs> it can be pretty challenging. And this series is going to challenge all of us, but we're in this together. We're all in this together. Amen? 
And this is good for us. God is constantly challenging us to, to innovate, to shake off what we've been doing over and over and over. That's what gets us all into trouble. And to find and to strive for new and better and creative ways of being God's people as He calls us to be. Amen? So we're going to jump right in if you want to follow along in your Bible. Luke chapter 14. And we'll start right in verse 1. Luke chapter 14. I'm sorry I don't have a... I guess I could give you a page number. I'm, a gen, I'm feeling generous this morning. Luke 14, it's on the bottom of page 847 in your pew Bible. I'm going to be reading from a different translation, though. Uh, for, I've shared with you all before that, that N.T. Wright is, is one of my, my heroes, and his specialty is first century history and the Greek language, the New Testament language. And he and his friend, his colleague, John Goldingay, have a fresh translation of the Bible, which is really refreshing to read. It just makes it simple, and they focused on the cohesive story of the entire biblical narrative, which is hard to do. But that's how the Bible was read in, in ancient times. It was read as one book. It was the Old Testament at that time, but it's one story. So they've called it the Bible for everyone. So that, that's what I'm going to be reading from. You can still follow along. We start right in Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus went to a meal in the house of a leading Pharisee. They were keeping a close eye on him. The Pharisees were gauging Jesus always. And Jesus, as always, was masterfully gauging every, every scene he approached. He's a master at it. So let's just take our cue from Jesus and gauge the scene from his perspective. What's going on here? Who's there? Well, we're told we, he's at a dinner party at the Pharisees. Verse 3 says that there are also experts of the law present at this meal, lawyers. We, we have Jesus, we have God in the flesh in the midst of this party. And we also have this man that we're told about with dropsy. What, well, what's dropsy? Some translations have an abnormal swelling of the body, but what is dropsy? Well, today it's called edema, and during Jesus' time it was an utter mystery, a complete and utter mystery. Today we know it's a sign of heart failure. And I came across a description of this condition uh, from an 11th century A.D. source, and the person described with this condition had to sit up all the time. And this person writes, he was unable to lie on either side. He was forced to sit upright to breathe at all. His stomach was very enlarged. His feet were also swelled up. Fever had laid him low. Some doctors wanted to do catheterization to relieve the fluids. If by chance he did lie on his back, the suffocation was awful. Sleep would speedily overcome him, and there was danger of asphyxia. Really disturbing imagery and a sign of a really serious problem. The person writing seems to be greatly concerned and troubled. So in Luke, the question now is, what is this very, very sick person doing at this dinner party with Pharisees and lawyers? He should be at a doctor, shouldn't he? Right? I mean, even if they don't know what it is, he should be at a doctor. Why aren't these Pharisees and lawyers taking him to the doctor? No one seems concerned, at least in this story, this account, no one seems concerned about his health except Jesus. So is he there, perhaps, for their curiosity and entertainment? Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Behold the wonder of the incredible swelling man. Or maybe this poor guy was at the hospital, right? Getting treated, and, and, and then the Pharisees and the lawyers show up and picked him out of an infirmity lineup shamefully hauled them to their soiree as bait to trap Jesus at their dinner party. You all realize that none of these possible scenarios are painting the attendees, the hosts of this shindig in a good light, right? You get that? So Jesus looks at everyone there, and, and, and he looks down at this guy in desperate need, and he knows instantly it's a test his heart must have dropped. I, I mean, I think he's livid. I think he's disgusted. I think he's infuriated. I mean, it's pretty clear that these people don't care at all about this, this person's health and this life-threatening condition. They don't care that he's dying. 
He's dying. His body is failing. His family will soon be without a father. They don't care about the pain he's in. Trouble breathing. Lungs must have been aching for air. They don't care about the embarrassment he's now suffering as he's displayed in front of them all. He's just an object to be used, a bait to trap Jesus. Do you ever put yourself into some of these accounts in the Bible? I do. I'm I'm constantly doing it. It's hard not to. N.T. Wright's translation really captures the emotion of what's going on here. And picking up in verse 2, there was a man there in front of Jesus who suffered from dropsy. So Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? They remained silent. The obvious answer, the right answer, the answer that Jesus desperately wanted to hear was, yes, yes, Master, of course it is proper to heal at any time, but just ignorance and silence. We move on. So he took the man, healed him, and dismissed him. We're not even told what he said. He just healed the man and sent him home. And then he said to to them, suppose one of you has a son, and I love this, or or an ox. (laughs) If you can't imagine your son in need on a Sabbath, how about an ox? How about an animal that falls into a well? Are you going to tell me that you won't pull him out straight away on the Sabbath day? They had no answer for that. You hear the anger, the frustration in Jesus' tone. I read this and, and, and I think to myself, yes, Jesus, yes, amen. Give them a piece of your mind. Are some of you thinking that too? I am. Well, here's one of those spiritual mirror moments I talked about earlier. God's Holy Spirit is telling all of us right now, find yourself in that story. Find yourself in that story. Do you hear, hear the Spirit whispering that? So let's imagine the scene together. It's always a good idea to imagine the scene. Let's attempt to paint the picture of what's going on. It's a Sabbath day. It's a holy day. Like Thanksgiving day, like a holiday, Christmas day, Super Bowl, right? And Jesus, this no good Nick, was making these blasphemous claims. He gets invited to this party on this holy day. We're beginning to see the scene. He walks up to the door, knocks. Who answered the door, I wonder? Who do you think answered the door? A maid? A a butler? Maybe a child of one of the guests or hosts of this dinner party? Did whoever answered the door instantly recognize Jesus? You think? Did Jesus have to wait before he was announced in some kind of foyer? Silence at his name in in the hall, right? Maybe some snickering and laughing. It's obvious to Jesus, especially in this moment, that all the other guests have arrived well before him. I guess kind of like a surprise party, right? Where the normal guests are told to arrive in such and such time, and then the guest of honor is told to arrive a little later, so preparations can be made. But in this case, in the the case of this account, everyone in fact has already eaten. Interesting. He, Jesus, apparently wasn't important enough to wait for. He wasn't even offered a a plate at the table, at least not in this account. Are you getting a clearer picture here? So Jesus is finally escorted into the dining room. I think it was a much larger event than we're imagining. Pharisees, church leaders, lawyers, upholders of rule and order. So I, I think it had to be a pretty large room, elaborately decorated the stench of aged wine and fermented superiority stinging our Savior's nostrils. Tables arranged and pushed to the edge of the room, giving plenty of space for the show. You know, the, the inquisition, the, the bloated freak and the rabble-rouser. I picture the guests reclining behind the tables, arms folded, maybe standing around the perimeter of the room for those that wanted a better seen, arms folded, eyes glaring, noses high, numerous attendees clearing plates and refilling glasses, folding napkins, bringing more food. And in the center of this semicircle is this poor dying gentleman, swollen, out of breath, probably drenched with sweat and other bodily fluids, out of place with the rest of the gang. 
not from a respectable social class. In obvious pain, his heart can't keep up. He's tired, but he's terrified of falling asleep because sleep means death. And his time is short. He knows this. He must have known this. Weeks, maybe even days. Maybe he's already started saying goodbye to family. No hope already gone in his mind. Can you see this? Can you, can you picture that scene? All the religious leaders and lawyers are arranged at the edge of the room with one sick man in the center and the focus is now on Jesus entering. All eyes on Jesus. And it's at this moment God is saying, find yourself, my child, in this scene. Find yourself in this scene. Can you picture yourself in this scene? My first thought is, well, I'm certainly not Jesus, right? Maybe I'm the sick guy. Maybe some of us can identify with that sick person, dealing with symptoms and pain and suffering. Maybe some of us have sought treatment from multiple sources. And we still have questions that aren't answered. No answers, no relief. Maybe that's some of us. Uh, maybe I'm one of the servants or the attendees, you know, bustling around, trying to keep the party going, pretending like nothing's going on. Although you can feel something is about to happen. Keeping my head down, keeping the goblets full, trying to keep everyone happy. Maybe that's some of us. Everyone happy and satiated. Maybe some of us have been told to keep our place. Keep your mouth shut. This is how things are done. This is how it's going to go. Just shut up and do your job. Maybe that is some of us. Maybe I'm... Wait, who's left? <laughs> the only ones left are the robed and adorned ones skulking around the edge of the room at the table. Huh. No. No. I mean, the only ones left are the Pharisees and the leaders. That, that couldn't be me, right? Right, God? Can't be me. Could it? Highly educated, devoutly spiritual types who hold positions of responsibility in the community. They had each spent years studying and reading the Old Testament, the Bible of their day, and they knew all the rules and regulations, mostly by heart. They tried their best to live their lives by those laws. It's the way things have been done and it's the way things are going to be done. You know, they thought very little of people that who didn't want to do the same. No one, certainly not some maverick newcomer, was going to rock their boat. My friends, that spiritual mirror is up. Who do you see staring back in that reflection? God is asking. Well, let's read the next part of our passage. Jesus noticed how the guest chose the best seat. And he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, he said, don't go and sit in the best seat in case some other guest is more important. And the person who invited you both comes to you and says to you, please move down for this man. And you will go to the end of the line covered with embarrassment. Instead, when someone invites you, go and sit down at the lowest place. Then when your host arrives, he will say to you, my dear fellow, come on, higher up. And then all your fellow guests will show you respect. All who push themselves forward, you see, will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be honored. I like N.T. Wright's phrasing there. It really captures what's going on in the original language. So does God have your attention? He most definitely has mine, dear friends. Jesus is talking about what Pharisees, what leaders, what people of high esteem typically do at public gatherings. In every line of work, there is what's called social posturing. Maybe some of us have seen this. Do you know what this is? You find it in the military. Everyone knows quite clearly who the ranking officer is. You know, who the most junior officer is at, at pretty much any given moment. You find it in companies where everyone knows the CEO, who are the vice presidents and the ones holding senior positions, and the one who cleans the bathrooms, if they're even invited to some of these gatherings. You find it in the animal kingdom even. In hen houses, for instance, where all the chickens know who, who's the head rooster. It's called the pecking order. That's why it's called the pecking order. It's even in my line of work. 
It's just a little more subtle. You know, at every pastor's conference, every gathering of, of pastors and, and leaders, the questions people always want answered is, how big is your church? Do you have a doctorate? How many letters after your name on your business card? Have you written any books? Articles are okay. How many? Are you in demand to speak outside of your church? Get the subtlety? In Jesus' day, the pecking order was a little more blatant. The more important you were, the closer you sat to the host at any social situation. So this is what Jesus is addressing. Don't seek the best seat, he says. Don't assume that you're among the most important in the room at any given time. Seek the place of humility. And then let God exalt you when it's appropriate. So at this point, Jesus now addresses the host of this gathering in verses 12 to 14. He's basically saying, when you host, when you throw a party, when you host a party, don't just invite the nice, safe, put-together, cleaned-up people who are already in your social circle. That's not who God sent his son for, right? Right? Instead, whenever you throw a party, use it as an opportunity to invite the not-so-cleaned-up people who don't know how to throw parties, maybe who've never been to any parties. If you do that, Jesus says, God will be pleased because that's the kind of party he throws. He's looking to bless people who are willing to invite outsiders to his party. So here's the question Jesus is asking each and every one of us really couldn't be more clear. Who are you inviting to the party? This party, here. Who are you inviting to Greenwoods? Are you inviting anyone to Greenwoods? Because, friends, inviting is a big part of the job as, as God's people. Yes? I just have a couple of questions here, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself this too. If you're not inviting anyone to Greenwoods, Why? And be honest, is it something w w with you? Or is it something to do with Greenwoods? The next question, if you are inviting people, who are you inviting? How are you inviting? Are you inviting people you'd like to see here on Sundays? Are you inviting people you wouldn't like to see here on Sundays? These are tough questions, right? God is clear. He wants us to be inviting as many as possible. Really, we should always be inviting others to Greenwoods, not just people we like. We should be inviting people we may not get along with. Whether we like others or not is really irrelevant in God's eyes. Just invite, he would say. Just invite, period. Here's that spiritual mirror again. Who, who are you in this passage? I was nervous before this sermon. This is, this is tough. Are you willing to glance at that mirror and see who's staring back? I'm nervous to see who's in that mirror. Are you inviting others to God's party at Greenwoods? Who are you inviting? Are you exclusive with your invitations or are you inclusive? Are you willing to pray a prayer with me? This is, this is what I prayed in preparation for this sermon. If anyone wants to just silently pray along with me, you're welcome to do so. Depending on who you see in that spiritual mirror, this is what I prayed. Father God, are you telling me that, that I could be a Pharisee? I could be a Pharisee in that story. This is what I prayed. Father, I think my purpose in life has gotten maybe a little out of alignment. And I think I'm involved in something that's allowed me to forget who the party's for, God. And I'm sorry. Sorry for living this way. I don't know what to do, but I want you to change me in Jesus' name. Amen. That's what I prayed. That's what I prayed. Listen to what a pastor shares. This pastor struggled with these very questions that we're struggling and wrestling with this morning. He and his leadership took time to gaze in that spiritual mirror and realize and study who was staring back. That's hard work. And they weren't satisfied. It's scary work, but it's necessary work as God's people. So we need each other, right? If we're called Christ followers, we need each other. Here's what this pastor says. In the initial core building stage of, of the church, this church he was pastoring for many years, before we went public, 
We all agreed that whatever happened to us, we never wanted to become Pharisees again. That's what he said. We never wanted to be a part of a church where status took precedence over humility. We never would again be willing to be part of a church that only invited the already convinced to the party. So when we opened the doors of the church, instead of surveying Christians about what kinds of music they enjoyed, we surveyed seekers. Instead of singing songs written by dead Germans, we sang songs with melodies that sprang from our surrounding culture. Instead of developing a predictable liturgy, we wanted to inject art, drama, dance, so that people who went to events other than church services would feel like they understood and appreciated what was going on. Instead of asking every person to know where each passage was in the Bible, we would print the page number right on the wall so that there would be no stratification or spirituality in the midst. And the pastor concludes with a challenge for all of us. Can you see why we do things a little differently than many other churches? So here are some things that I learned from today's scripture reading in Luke 14. God's word is powerful. Amen. God speaks to me through his word. God speaks to you through his word. So we should be spending time in it. But he speaks only if we're willing to listen and consider the truth about ourselves. Only if I'm willing to gaze into that spiritual mirror. Number two, prayer is powerful. Hallelujah. Prayer is powerful. A little two-sentence prayer, even a mutter. God hears it. Amen? It has the power to change my heart, my career, my location, my fulfillment, my significance, my sense of God's presence and closeness. Hallelujah. Number three, this is what I learned. It's easy to become a Pharisee. It's easy to get to the place in your life where you think you know what the rules are and then start living as if the rules matter more than the people do. Number four, it's easy to get fuzzy on the purposes of life. In the last series, I shared about how my purpose in life got fuzzy. That was a really scary time for me. Leaving acting, leaving New York. <laughs> Why did I go to acting school? Why did I get into debt at acting school, God, if I'm not going to use those gifts? Fuzzy purpose. And five, God always wants outsiders invited to his party. Always. I hope you'll embrace these lessons with me. Will you? Will you let God's Word into your life? Will you set aside a time each day to read? It's hard sometimes. To, uh, every day, read. Listen for Him. And then, allow God to hold up that mirror. If He needs to open your eyes for you to look into it, ask Him to do that. That's, what, that's His work. That's what He's about doing. And will you do something if, if, if you or he isn't satisfied with who you see staring back? Will you pray? Would you be willing to pray this prayer in your life if it's not perfectly aligned with God's purposes? Just a simple prayer. God, I'm sorry for living this way. I don't know what to do. It's okay to say that. I don't know what to do, but I want you to change me. Help me find significance, God. You see it in me. Help me to see it. That's a bold prayer. That's a life-changing prayer. That's a powerful prayer. It's a prayer of significance. And finally, will you invite outsiders to Greenwoods, to this party? For first century Jews, just the mention of a banquet brought forth thoughts of heaven. Because in a prophecy in the Old Testament, the Bible describes a banquet that will take place in heaven. It's a beautiful picture, and all the Jewish people anticipated this. The prophecy says, And Yahweh of armies will make for all peoples on this mountain a banquet with rich foods, a banquet with aged wines, juicy, rich foods, refined, aged wines. He will swallow up on this mountain the layer of wrapping. What is that layer of wrapping? The wrapping over all the peoples, the covering that is spread out over all the nations. What's that covering? He will have swallowed up death permanently. Do you feel death wrapped around you in this world? Death's hold? This says God's going to swallow it up. He will have swallowed up death permanently. The Lord Yahweh will wipe the tears from on all faces. The reviling of His people He will take away from all the earth. Praise God. It's Isaiah 25. So when Jesus talks about who to invite to this banquet, 
One of the guys at the table thinks it's about this prophecy in Isaiah 25. And he just blurts out, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Subtext, I want to be at that banquet. I want to be at that party. Well, again, Jesus has something to say. And you can still sense the agitation. Jesus says, once a man made a great dinner and invited lots of guests. When the time for the meal arrived, he sent his servant to say to the guests, come now, everything is ready. But the whole pack of them began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I really have to go and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another one said, I've just bought the five yoke of of oxen and I've got to go and test them out. Please accept my apologies. And another one said, I've just got married, so naturally I can't come. So the servant went back and told the master all this. The householder was cross and said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets the lanes of the town, and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. All right, master, said the servant. I've done that, but there's still room. Well then, the master said to the servant, go out into the roads and hedgerows and make them come in so that my house may be full. Let me tell you this, none of those people who were invited will get to taste my dinner. It's a colorful powerful story, but it takes on a whole lot more color and power if you know just a few things about first century banquets, one of which is that only great people put on great banquets. Only they could afford to do it. Commoners might have a friend over every now and then, but only important people, only noble people invited large groups of people to extravagant parties. So the person who hosts this banquet must have been a great esteemed person. Everyone around the table who heard Jesus tell this story would think, would think this. Another thing to know is that RSVPs back then were extremely important in that day. It's, it's a sad thing that we've lost that sense of custom and etiquette in today's age, social graces and manners. It's a shame because the process of slaughtering and butchering and then roasting the meat was so time-consuming. Because there was no refrigeration, a party giver would only cook as much meat as could be eaten by his or her guests that evening. So the type of meat served at a banquet was actually chosen after the number of guests had RSVP'd, after the number was known. You see how RSVPs were vital. Here's just a formula that I came across um, of number of guests and protein served. This was pretty much a standard in first century, uh, in, in first century AD. Two to four guests, chicken. Five to eight, duck. 10 to 15, goat. 15 to 35, lamb. 35 to 75, beef. That was pretty much, in general, the formula used. I'm glad I wasn't alive back then because if I was privileged enough to be invited to a dinner party and only 12 others accepted the invitation, I'd apparently be eating goat. I hear it's not so bad. Sorry, that was... Sorry. But you can see from this how important an RSVP is to an invitation, right? Sorry. I I can't say that that's never going to happen again. You all know me, right? So if you accepted the invitation, if you accepted, if you RSVP'd yes, that meant you were coming. You'd given your word, really. And that's something else we've lost today, is the value of one's word. So that invitation would come several days before the banquet. The host would total up the number of attendees and order up the appropriate meat, goat, lamb, beef, hopefully beef. And then just before the meal was actually served, the host would send out a second invitation, an in-person invitation. This is fascinating. As the meat was being cooked, he or she would send the servant around to your home to say, dinner's almost ready, it's time to come to dinner. Interesting. Jesus is very, very careful and strategic with the words he chooses in this parable. Because if you notice, the servant said, come on now, everything's ready. Well, every person that he was telling this to around the table would know that Jesus was describing that second invitation. So these people had already given their word that they'd be there. 
Everyone knew that those who were invited had already given their word. They were planning to attend. They had RSVP'd yes, so when the second in-person invitation arrived at the door, they went back on their word. Sorry, can't be there. They lied. Really, back then it was a lie. And friends, if you lied or you insulted people in, in that kind of culture back then, you were shunned. You were even banished from society. You were blacklisted at the markets. Your neighbors, your community, your family would know about this. And if your family didn't shun you, they were shunned as well. You see the ripple effect of sin. So here's what those Pharisees and those lawyers heard Jesus saying in, in this parable. God invited the well-to-do to his extravagant party, and they lied to him. They lied to him. They didn't bother to show up. So God skipped the upper class and rounded up the riffraff of Israel to invite to his party. And there was still more room. So he went to the next class down, the unclean class, the socially dirty and disgraceful class. He actually invited people outside of Israel, Gentiles, to his party. What Jesus was saying to those religious leaders was some of you are probably, if not already, rejecting God's offer of the banquet in heaven. You can do that if you want to, but just know that it's going to be very hurtful to him because he will see through every excuse you offer. He will hold you accountable to every lie, but then God's going to still fill heaven. No doubt about it, with or without you. He is on a mission to fill heaven, and he will do it with whoever is willing to be around that table. Amen? So here, here's the final lesson. God's purpose is to fill heaven with people from all walks of life. I love that. It's a beautiful thing about our God. He wants to fill heaven with people from all walks of life. Which means He looks at all of us and sees significance. Right? Because the invitation He makes to get to that banquet is for all of us. Everyone. We're important enough to be at that table. God wants and has planned so much more for all of His children. In terms of our commitment to Him, He always wants more commitment. That's what I'm learning. That's a tough lesson too. He wants more effort put into knowing Him. We could always be doing more to get to know our God, couldn't we? I could. He wants more commitment in following Him and in advancing His kingdom. That's His work, friends. And we're a part of that. We could always be doing significantly more. Amen? My friends, we were created for significance. And that's the series. And, and according to Jesus, that significance is tied into the very plan and heart of God. We all have a significant part to play. He incorporates us and invites us to be a part of His significant work. What a beautiful thing that is. So let's play our parts. Can we do that? Let's play them boldly and sincerely and intensely. Not like Pharisees. Not, not for the purpose of winning the best seats, but for the purpose of honoring God and advancing His cause together. So... What do you think? Will you continue with me on this journey of significance, embracing our significance as God's people? Some of these lessons are, are tough, are hard, but if we're not challenged in our significance in God's eyes, then what are we doing? You know, we could always be doing more. And I hope and pray that you will join me on this series. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you.